Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you could come tonight. And I'm just going to open in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for the book of Daniel and how relevant it, it really is to today. And the wisdom and the knowledge that you have given us, the prophecy, the heads up, essentially, on what is still to come in the future. And Lord, we thank you for these accounts of kings and um, prophets and dreams and visions from several thousand years ago, Lord. And we do thank you for the accuracy of those prophecies and the, the ones that have already come to pass, Lord, so that we can be sure that the ones that still are coming are reliable, Lord. And so, Lord, um, I just invite you here in our midst and ask for your spirit to anoint me so that my words have um, the, the power that you desire to come from your, your word for us tonight, God. My own notes are, are flat, but you can bring life to them, and you can speak to us through your living word tonight. And so we come before you trusting that that is what your plan is, and that you will minister to us through your word. And I simply make myself available. I pray you give me clear thoughts and clear words, and I thank you for the privilege of sharing from your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. I had a bit of a rough week, and so I'm afraid my mind will be a little bit boggled, but I'm trusting he is going to meet me here. And so um, it's parenting is not for cowards. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So um, it's interesting. This chapter is about a, um, a man whose own father was the king, but he was also the king. So you can imagine the interesting family dynamics that were going on in a regency government in a, a family line that, um, according to historians, had a lot of bumps in it. So um, we switch here from Nebuchadnezzar to his grandson, Belshazzar, tonight. And um, I'll just begin with verse 1. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for thousands of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels which had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Well, for anyone who has read any of the rest of the Old Testament, this is a giant warning sign. You do not worship idols in the first place, but to be using God's holy vessels to worship idols, that's a pretty scary place to begin. So this great feast, it mentions it has a thousand guests. Well, that would have simply been, as they did in the Bible, they counted the men. Like the feeding of the 5,000 had 5,000 men at it, plus unknown numbers of women and children. So likely this feast had thousands of guests, because if every man brought one wife, well, there you go. And it appears that the king brought a number of wives and concubines. So this would have been very full. And then the amount of servants needed to wait on these people, it would have been a very, very busy hall. And wherever there is wine in profusion, there is likely to be chaos. And so this would have been um, likely a, a feast that lasted days, if not weeks. We don't know. It doesn't mention how long this feast lasted. But for all we know, these people have been in a drunken stupor for quite some time. And it's just very loud and ruckus in this building at this time. There's doubtless music playing, loud laughing and carousing. It was a bit of a um, kind of a place that if you had any sort of decency, you'd want to avoid. And as we'll notice, two characters come into the feast that weren't in there, indicating perhaps a higher moral standard to begin with, one of them being Daniel. Now, it mentions that they bring the vessels from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem. Now, those um, words, had been, it, are in parentheses in a lot of um, Bibles because, or in italics because they're not actually in the Aramaic. But the implication of the, the passage, past tense, 
is that this had been the case at some point, but if you actually look at the time frame, the temple is destroyed at this point. And this is the first mention of it in the book of Daniel, that the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, has since been destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar um, destroyed Jerusalem, invaded it, and took the very last of the people he wanted off to Babylon, leaving the very poorest there. And so he brings these gold vessels and silver vessels, which elsewhere in the Bible we read, some of them were labeled holiness to Jehovah. In other words, these were holy vessels dedicated to the God of the universe, and they were only to be used in ceremonial worship. We see what happens in other passages in the Bible when anybody messes with the tiniest bit of how God is worshipped, whether they're using the wrong incense or they are treating the elements or the, the, the sacrifices casually. Like um, we just read about Hophni and Phinehas who were um, sentenced to death by God for um, basically treating the worship of God, the sacrifices of the people very casually and using it for their own greedy purposes. So this Belshazzar has absolutely no fear of the God of the Bible and he takes his holy temple ceremonial cups and brings them to his feast, which in, the, in their toasts, they no doubt took turns honoring the very many multicultural pantheon of gods in Babylon. It um, mentions plural um, gods and that's interesting because this feast, based on the time frame given, um, this being the, right before the night that Babylon falls, essentially, we actually know from secular history that that was the 16th of Tishri of the, the Babylonian slash Jewish calendar. Um, the Jewish calendar was actually labeled month one, month two, month three, month four, all throughout the Bible. But once they moved to Babylon, they just simply adopted the Babylonian names. And those are still used today. The Jewish calendar still uses the Babylonian months. So um, Tishri is um, a Babylonian month. And Tishri, 16th of Tishri falls during the, the Feast to the Moon God, Sin. And so um, this is actually, a lot of people believe, um, the origin of the the moon god um, that eventually comes to be worshipped by the Mohammedans and you know comes to be known as Allah because he was originally a moon god but at any rate they were honoring the moon god but they didn't want anybody else to feel left out so they are honoring all of the gods and it's interesting they mention all the different materials that these gods are made of notice none of them are spirit of course behind all these idols of wood and stone and gold and silver are demonic entities, for sure, that are happy to receive the worship of men. But at the same time, it's clear they are worshiping idols, and there may have actually been idols in this hall that libations were poured out to. Um, there is another object in this hall, which in the very next verse mentions, which is very interesting, because although it's not clear if it is the object from the temple, it very well could be. Dr. David Jeremiah of Shadow Mountain Community Church in San Diego has a, a great Daniel commentary. And he, he says he believes that this lampstand mentioned is actually the one from the temple in Jerusalem. So verse 5, in the same hour, that feast, and the bringing out the silver cups and gold cups from the temple, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosed, and his knees knocked against each other. So that describes utter terror. When you lose any function in your body because of fear, that is a sign that it's just gone to your nervous system. Your fear has paralyzed you, essentially. And what he sees is frightening. He's no doubt in a drunken stupor to begin with, which doesn't help any sort of clarity in any weird situation. But even if he had been completely sober, this would have been scary because on this big wall, a giant hand, disembodied, appears and begins to write with the finger letters on the wall. And it's written in Aramaic. It's not that the language was ununderstandable, but we come to see that he has no idea what what is written there means. Now, I find it interesting that it mentions that it's um, a hand um, that is writing on it. it now, it, 
it says the fingers of a man's hand. It's almost like it's not a hand holding a quill or a pen. It mentions that it's the fingers that are actually writing it, which of course brings to mind, in my mind at least, the story and account of Jesus with the adulterous woman when he wrote in the sand, in the dirt. And he wrote, he stooped down and wrote in the sand with his finger. But it also brings to mind how God on Mount Sinai, with his finger, with his hand, inscribed the Ten Commandments onto the tablets of stone. Which then, of course, as soon as you bring up that, makes me think of the promise of the New Covenant, which promises that he's going to write his laws on the tablet of our hearts. And so, in all of these cases, it appears that God's hand, in writing something, has everything to do with his holiness and righteousness. Um, beginning with the tablets of the law, establishing what is right, what is wrong for all of humanity to understand so that no one can be without excuse. I mean, our consciences are great, but they can, we can excuse ourselves to ourselves very easily. Oh, well, I did this because of that and justify it. But his law clarified that. When he wrote on the dirt, most likely he was writing down something that provoked the consciences of those watching because they all left one by one when Jesus said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. So what he was writing may have been the Ten Commandments. It may have been the specific sins that those who were there present were guilty of that they knew of, hidden sins. We don't know, but it accomplished almost the same effect as the, the law of Moses in that it convicted mankind of their need for a savior. And the new covenant is the fulfillment of all of that where God essentially gives us the ability by putting his law inside us supernaturally that we are able to finally be able to live out and fulfill righteousness through the power of his Holy Spirit working in us. However, in this particular case, I do believe that if Belshazzar had had a soft heart, like his grandfather, which I'll get into the, who he is, um, <coughs> did, then this may have accomplished the same purpose that the law being written or the fingers in the sand may have accomplished. He could have been convicted and repented. He could have. There is always, always, always room for repentance. Even in a last hour, the 11th hour, 1159, before judgment, there is always room for repentance. But as we'll continue reading, repentance is the farthest thing from Belshazzar's mind at this point. And as such, the writing on the wall essentially means judgment. And it is, by the way, where we get that idiom, the writings on the wall. So many of our idioms come from the Bible. So, verse 7, the king cried aloud and brought to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. Sounds familiar. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be third ruler in the kingdom. More on that in a few verses. Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. Now this again, it's a familiar scenario for the book of Daniel. We've already read several times that the king has called in all of his men, you know, all the king's horses and all the king's men. No, um, all of his astrologers and soothsayers and magicians, and again, they are clueless. They have no idea how to interpret that. Again, it was Aramaic. They could read it. They knew what the words were. It wasn't like they didn't have a dictionary, but they were completely unable to make sense of what the meaning of it was and how it applied to Nebuchadnezzar, the feast, the situation, anything. They didn't even know what God had written this. They just knew that it was a troubling sign and the king was really bothered by it. So, sounds like a job for Daniel. But where, where is Daniel? Again, he's not for some reason ever included in the first batch of these magicians and astrologers and wise men. It appears that he kind of keeps to himself until he's called. He maybe just was busy with his duties. But um, in this case, 
it appears, based on a few verses later, that Daniel may actually have kind of been shoved off to the side. I don't know that he was completely um, removed from his position because he mentions in the first chapter that he held this position all the way to Cyrus, which it hasn't gotten to Cyrus yet, so he's still a wise man, but he appears to have kind of just been pushed off into the sidelines. And we see this because Belshazzar doesn't even know who he is. Now, verse 10, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banqueting hall. Pause there. It mentions that the king already had his wives there. Who is this queen then? Most historians believe that this is actually a reference to the queen mom, Nebuchadnezzar's wife. Now, Nebuchadnezzar would have had a lot of wives, and um, <coughs> chances are they were younger than him. And this woman um, has, is still alive, is still holding the position of queen. Um, a couple generations later, I mean, a lot of time has passed. Um, there was a, a series of kings that all had very short reigns, somewhere between months and a few years, all that died in succession. There was coups and there was all sorts of crazy events. And then we get down to Nabonidus, who, um, whether he was actually a direct son of Nebuchadnezzar or the son-in-law through um, marrying one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. It's unclear in history. However, his son was Belshazzar. And so Belshazzar was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. So back up near the top where it mentioned that um, his father Nebuchadnezzar, um, where was that? Anyways, I've lost it in my notes. but. Um, it's actually referring to his grandfather, just like the, your, my father would be King David if, if, if Jesus was saying, oh yeah, my, my father, King David. It's talking about going back to the, the last important ancestor, essentially. So anyways, um, she comes into the banqueting hall. She had the good sense not to come to this feast. And the queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. Seems that she remembers this. Nebuchadnezzar said the same thing about him. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, soothsayers, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as the excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. Well, that's a glowing recommendation. I mean, she went through the whole list. I mean, excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, explaining enigmas. I mean, this guy's brilliant is what she's saying. He's utterly brilliant, and he's gotten in with the high God. And so it's, it's very interesting. She knows who Daniel is. Um, it's not clear if she herself is a worshiper of this God, but she certainly respects Daniel. Now, um, yeah, I'll just keep reading. Verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah whom my father the king brought from Judah? I've heard of you that the spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, had been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So, um, Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, blah, Belshazzar meets Daniel. And Daniel is an older man by this point. I mean, he was a teenager when he was brought in, so he's not that old. But he is an older man. And this is clearly Belshazzar's first interaction with him. He's like, are you the one, the one that everyone's talking about? All right. Um, my wise men are stupid. That's basically what he says. Like, they, I brought them here. They know nothing. I've heard you might be able to help out. And then he offers him the position of third in the kingdom, which is very interesting. And um, it 
fits perfectly with historical records because what we find is that this was, like I mentioned at the beginning, a regency. Um, Nabonidus, the king, was still king, but for whatever reason, he had put himself according to secular records, in sort of an exile. Some said he was commanding troops, others that he was simply hanging out. Don't know if there was mental health issues there. History is not clear. But he was, by all accounts, a terrible king. And the records imply that he was incredibly foolish. And, um, and in the account, in all sorts of different secular his histories, um, Belshazzar is slain at the taking of Jerusalem, but Nabonidus is simply captured. He's treated as essentially a fool. And so Belshazzar, however foolish he was spiritually, um, he's seen to actually be the smarter of the two. Now, this may simply be because of senility, right? That Nabonidus may just simply have had mental health issues, and as a result, his son was put forward. Or maybe he really just was an incompetent man who never should have been given the throne. We don't know, but at any rate, he was the king. Belshazzar was the one practically ruling the kingdom. And as such, the next in line after him would be the third position, essentially the prime minister, which is what he offers to whoever can solve this riddle. Whoever is wise enough to figure out the writing on the wall can be my prime minister. Um, now, uh, it is interesting. Um, nope, I'll skip that. We'll get to that later. Then Daniel answered, verse 17, and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father the kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. Wow, that sounds like the kind of authority and power that some of our world leaders would love to have today. But at any rate, Nebuchadnezzar actually had that all um, power over the nations. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed of from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Now this is interesting. Daniel's like, I don't want your reward. I have no interest in being prime minister. It, this is sort of like being offered the penthouse on the Titanic while it's sinking, like no thanks. But I am going to give you a little lesson. He's gonna school Belshazzar. He's like, so before I tell you the interpretation, let me tell you about your grandfather, the guy that everybody knows, the great king Nebuchadnezzar, who basically ruled the entire world by the power, authority, and permission of the Most High God. This king was lifted up in pride and was hardened, and God humbled him. And the implication is, if that could happen to him, then what on earth are you thinking? And so, he continues in verse 22. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. This was no new history lesson. He had been brought up knowing this. He knew the story. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar had converted to worshiping Jehovah. It was probably like the skeleton in the closet for the Babylonian royal family. Like, oh, oh, yeah, he, he was a great king, but yeah, that unfortunate thing. I can understand why. I mean, Jehovah did make him go crazy and then restored him, but yeah, he was definitely not PC. Let's quickly just shove this under the records because it is interesting. That's not recorded in any secular history of Nebuchadnezzar. They intentionally did not mention that he became a follower of the Jewish God. Continuing, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Sounds a lot like Lucifer. 
They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, sacrilege. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. I mean, that's terrifying in and of itself. Comparing the honoring of these dumb idols to the God of the universe who literally holds your life breath in his hands, who could snuff you out in a split second, that God you have not glorified. And unlike your father who repented, you have hardened yourself and lifted yourself up against God. In other words, Belshazzar had every reason to not be a foolish, proud king. This man had been brought up with the testimony which went out over the whole world and no doubt a relationship with when he was younger, his grandfather, who was the most prominent Jehovah worshiper in the world in that time period. And he heard the stories, he knew the truth of it, and yet he still didn't learn from it. It's kind of unbelievable when you really think about it. This is a man who, who was essentially given the same amount of witness as the Jewish peoples had been given. He was exceedingly accountable. This was not a man who was only exposed to pagan deities. He literally had exposure documents, like the, the Bible was there in Babylon. His grandfather had become a follower. I just want to emphasize, this guy was essentially brought up in a Christian home, right? Like, that's the idea of it. He was raised by a, a powerful man who had a powerful testimony, and he still chose to go his own way, to lift himself up against this God, to mock him, to give him the bird, essentially, by taking the holy vessels from his temple and drinking from them. It was a way of... Um, of just completely dishonoring Jehovah to, to use his holy vessels for such a debauched feast. And we get to verse 24 and we find out what is finally written. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Many, many tekel ufarsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So these were words that were not completely unknown. It would be like saying nickel, quarter, dollar. Like these were actual money amounts. That's what they were. Um, the Hebrew words are very similar. This is um, Aramaic. Um, the mene is, in Hebrew, a mina, and you can read about minas, you know, they're used as a form of currency and money, both Old and New Testament. The word tekel is shekel in Hebrew, and perez, or ufarsin, ufarsin is basically, the u means and, it's like a, it's a prefix that means and on a word, and um, Farsin is just simply plural, so um, it's the same word as perez, in case you were curious about that. Um, a perez was also a unit of measurement, and it's the same word in Hebrew as it is in Aramaic. And what these were, if you actually had the coins, um, their value um, essentially was, they were all measured by weight, for, for one thing. They were all, um, you could have a silver mina, a silver shekel, or a silver perez, or a gold one, or I, I suppose you could have it even in copper. It was simply a, a coin by weight. And um, what I seem to remember is that uh, the mina is smaller than the shekel, but they come from the root words mana. Mina comes from mana, which means to count or number. It is also, um, I believe, let me see, did I write it in this one? Because I didn't see it in my my notes here. Um, yeah, it is. 
It's the name of a pagan goddess, the goddess of destiny. But at any rate, um, they, they could have been wondering, was this, the, was this, this goddess um, when they first read it? But it essentially means to number or count. The shekel, word shekel comes from the word to mean to weigh and pay out. And um, Perez literally means to divide in half. And so the Perez was the half weight of the shekel or the mina. So you could have a Perez shekel or a Perez mina, etc. You could see why this would be confusing for the king. He's like, why are all these money terms on the wall in giant letters? Why would some god send a giant hand to write nickel, dime, quarter? Like, it makes no sense. And you could see that his counselors are looking at it going, yeah, that means that, and a, there is a goddess named that. Oh, like, what is this saying? And so Daniel comes in and he's like, I got this. God's given me his spirit. I understand this. And this is a judgment. Essentially, God has been counting the days of this kingdom. The kingdom of Babylon has a start date and a finish date. It was already prophesied to Nebuchadnezzar that it would go from the head of gold down to the shoulders and arms of silver. Babylon was prophesied to have an end date. Nebuchadnezzar initially rebelled against that and built a statue all of gold to say, hey, my kingdom's never going to end. But God said, yeah, it is. And, um, <laughs> and this is that exact night that it's going to end. Your days have been counted and it, they're at the end. You have been weighed in the balances. You personally, Belshazzar, and you have been found wanting. And thus, Perez, your kingdom is going to be divided between the Medes and Persians, which is extremely interesting because historians for a long time believed that the Persians were the ones who conquered Babylon and the, that they had already absorbed the Median Empire whoop, bug, um, some years before. And they're like, yeah, this is just, this is not accurate history to say it was the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, as if they each have an equal arm. But it's extremely interesting when you actually look into um, more recently discovered um, documents. It's extremely clear that the Medes actually were hand in hand with the Persians and transferred their kingdom peacefully over to the Persians at the conquering of Babylon. And that has everything to do with the first king of Babylon under the Medes and Persians, King Darius. And it's a super interesting subject, but all that to say, Daniel, which should not be a shock to the Bible student, is completely accurate, more accurate than the secular historians. But at any rate, it was divided into that night, and literally the Medes and the Persians were together there conquering it that night. And um, it, it's, it's a judgment. And what I honestly believe is that if Belshazzar had heard those words and gone, oh God, I'm sorry, that God could have halted it. He could have been like, really, you're sorry? Oh, I guess you are, I see your heart. You're really, truly sorry. All right, I'll give you 10 years. Like God did that so many times in the Bible where people were like, we're sorry, and God's like, all right, the judgment's still going to happen, but I'm going to give you more time. And he kept doing that. That's the record of Israel. Like the prophets had come and they'd be like, judgment! And then people would repent and God would extend the period of grace. Nineveh, he never even judged it for like hundreds of years after Jonah came. Like the people repented and at the 40-day mark, Jonah's sitting there going, when are they going to get burnt up? And nothing happened. And he's like, you, you, I knew you'd do this. You'd forgive them. Why would you do that? That's why I didn't want to go tell them. But that is what happened over and over again. God would rather show mercy. He would rather show mercy. The very fact that this actually was the night that Babylon was taken, I do believe is because God saw Belshazzar's heart and he's like, nothing I could do could change that man's heart. So this is the end. I'm just going to put Babylon out of its misery. So verse 29, instead of him repenting, he just simply goes about fulfilling his promise, almost acting like what Daniel said had no meaning. Oh, well, no, we'll just make you prime minister. 
Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be third ruler in the kingdom. I can picture Daniel being like, thanks, I'll, I'll wear it for two hours. Like, it, it was the end of Babylon. And Daniel knew this. He just said that. He's like, your kingdom is being taken from you currently. And Belshazzar doesn't, he doesn't even act in self-defense going, it's being taken? Quickly, guards, go outside. Like, he, he's just like, oh, thank you. Let's put the robe on you. You'll be in third in my kingdom. Thank you. And we're told, very next verse, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Now, this is the part that I wasn't sure how much time we'd have for, but we do. So I will tell, tell you some of the history here because this is super interesting. How did Babylon fall that night? They're in the middle of this incredible feast. Everybody in the city is celebrating. It, I mean, so many gods, so many festivals. You could have a party every weekend in Babylon. It's kind of like Victoria downtown before the pandemic. There's just something going on all the time. And this is just one of the many festivals. But it is actually recorded that the entire city was essentially drunk. And when they entered in, they found it like incredibly easy to take over. So um, Herodotus, the Greek historian, tells us that um, the way that the Persians and Medes got into Babylon was that Cyrus, who was about 40 years old at that time, King Cyrus, um, his mother was actually a Persian and um, a Mede, and his father was a Persian. But at any rate, so he was kind of halfy halfy anyways. But he was at this point a general, and he led his troops to lay siege to Babylon. The siege was already in action before the feast began. Like, that just shows how proud the Babylonians were, how completely blind to their predicament that they were, that they would hold this lavish feast and be stupid drunk when you literally have an army camped outside your walls of two different nations, the Medes and the Persians, the only competing um, nations for any power in the world at that time. I mean, that, that's incredibly crazy. That's insane. And so they were already encamped around there, but they weren't having too much of an effect. Uh, Babylon was an incredibly fortified city, and they had tons of stores of food. I mean, it was really a glorious empire. But Cyrus noted that the Euphrates River went straight through Babylon. And now they had um, plenty of protection in place. Like where it entered in through the walls, they had a portcullis that went down into it. Like you couldn't get through the water. But it was a high river. It was a rushing river. It was not some tiny like stream. It was like a real river. And what he decided to do was actually dig channels a distance off to divert the river into various locations. Some say it went into swamps, some into various ditches, farmland, covered, flooding farm fields. But at any rate, he managed to lower the water level of the Euphrates so significantly that his men were actually able to get in underneath the portcullis at the very bottom of the riverbed. And they essentially walked into Babylon. And people were so drunk and partying that they didn't notice gee, the river is really, really low. And they just marched in and started slaying drunken people in the streets. And um, one of the generals that was with um, Cyrus was a man by the name of Gabrias. And he actually, we have his actual words recorded for us. He said that this night the whole city is given over to revelry. And I thought that was super interesting. But I will read the account that... Um, Another historian um, wrote uh, a document called Cyropedia. Thereupon they entered, and of those that they met, some were struck down and slain, and others fled to their houses. And some, were, some raised the hue and cry, but Grobrius and his friends covered the cry with their shouts, as though they were revelers themselves. And thus making their way by the quickest route, they soon found themselves before the king's palace. Here, the detachment under Gobrias and Gadatus found the gates closed, but the men appointed to attack the guards rushed on them as they lay drinking around a blazing fire and closed with them then and there. As the din grew louder and louder, 
Those within became aware of the tumult, till the king bidding them see what it meant, some of them opened the gates and ran out. Gadates and his men, seeing the gates swung wide, darted in, hard on the heels of the others who fled back again, and they chased them at the sword's point into the presence of the king. They found him on his feet with his drawn scimitar in his hand. By sheer weight of numbers, they overwhelmed him, and not one of his retinue escaped. They were all cut down, some flying, others snatching up anything to serve as a shield and defending themselves as best they could. And that's the historical secular record by someone who was there of what happened that night. Belshazzar standing with his sword. He was slain there on the spot. Um, other records record that they went and found Nabonidus, his father, and um, arrested him and hauled him off where he, he did die later on. But then verse 31, it jumps suddenly into the brand new order that was established that night. New king tonight. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. Now, this is interesting because it's sort of a weird place to end the chapter because although it mentions him just briefly, we read all about him in the very next chapter with Daniel in the lion's den. That's who he's famous for is the, um, the chapter. He's the king who had the lion's den. He decided he didn't like to kill people with the, the furnace. He liked the lion's den. So um, again, it appears that Daniel switches over as a wise man straight into Darius's kingdom. And we're told that Daniel stays in power all the way till the man who replaces Darius, which is Cyrus. Now, Darius is not mentioned in any secular history. However, there is another man who is. And it was a common belief by almost all early Christians and theologians and every single Jewish scholar that they were one and the same person. Um, and this man, um, I'll have to look down. What was his name? It's a weird name. It's not an English sounding name. Oh, it's Cyazarus. Cyazarus with an X. Cyazarus II. So, according to Josephus, this was our biggest clue that this is one and the same person who is a historical entity, uh, not entity, a historical person um, who was the first person to rule over Babylon after Belshazzar died, which is exactly who Darius was. Um, Cyazarus was by um, uh, all historical records known to be the son of, let's see if I can get his name right, Astyages, who was um, the king of the Medes. He was a very well-known king in history, Astyages. And he had a daughter, well, his sister married Nebuchadnezzar. So this may actually be the queen mom mentioned. Um, not actually sure. It, it's kind of hard to know because the names, her name's not given in the Bible. But we do know that Astyages, if I'm saying that correctly, his sister married King Nebuchadnezzar. And um, he had a daughter who um, married another king who gave birth to Cyrus the Great. But he had a son whose name was Cyazarus. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, <laughs> this is a loud laugh. Um, Cyazarus. So Cyazarus II um, was known to have ascended the throne after his father, but he was very old at the time, and he was living in the city of Ecbatana. So when Cyrus, who was his nephew, um, because his sister, his father's sister, oh, I've already lost it, sorry. Um, they were related. Um, when he went and conquered Babylon, Cyrus was there at the, at the victory. Darius slash Cyazarus was not. Cyazarus was old. He was in Ecbatana. When Cyrus got the king, when he captured Babylon, he was not yet the king of the Medes and the Persians. Um, he was likely going to be the king of the Persians, but he was not the king of the Medes yet. The kingdom had been nominally passed down to this old king who was barely reigning at all over the Medes. Medes. His name was Darius or Cyazarus. And so Cyrus invites him to come and live in Babylon and rule from there. 
And what then happens is that Caesarus gives Cyrus, Caesarus Darius gives Cyrus his daughter, and with his daughter, the dowry of the entire Median Empire. And thus, when Darius dies a few years later, like two or three years after he becomes essentially set up as king in Babylon, Cyrus peacefully inherits the entire Median half of the empire through his marriage to Darius's daughter, who is Cyazarus. Anyways, I hope that wasn't ridiculously confusing. It was really fun to study. But at any rate, um, he's an actual character. The Bible is 100% accurate. Anytime someone comes and says, oh, the historical records don't support that. That guy is not real. They invented him. It's, Daniel was confused. It was written hundreds of years after Daniel, blah, 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 blah. Inevitably, evidence will arise that not only completely supports the Bible, but um, there's a bug here. I'm having all sorts of interesting things tonight. But um, it not only supports the Bible, but it, it completely it, it adds so much more to our understanding of the scripture by explaining certain things in the text that we just accepted as sort of like, oh, okay, that's in there, but I don't understand why. Like, if you're just reading Daniel, you wouldn't know about Nabonidus. But you read the historical records and you go, oh, that's interesting. Okay, that makes sense. That's why he's the third in the kingdom, blah, blah, blah. And so I love when these evidences come out, not because the Bible wasn't true and could stand by itself, but it really does just fill it out and bring it to life in a way that feels so much more relevant. And also, it, I just love that no one has been able to ever disprove anything in the Bible, no matter how hard they tried. During the 1800s, people thought Assyria didn't exist. They're like, all oh, those passages about Assyria completely made up until they found Assyria and discovered that it was this world empire at one point, and with it, a library which was full of documents which then went and proved all the rest of the Bible. Really incredible. The documents in Assyria even had stuff about things before the flood. It's really cool. But at any rate, um, all of this could have been known by Babylon, by the way if they believed that the God of the Bible was the God of Daniel who could prophesy and it come true, Jeremiah prophesied of the fall of Babylon and he prophesied very specifically. In chapter 20, um, 50, verse 24, he said that it would be taken by trickery, by a snare. But even before that, he mentioned that, um, I think it was in uh, chapter 24, I thought I had it written here, but it doesn't appear in my notes. Um, in chapter 24, it actually says that it would fall in the generation of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Belshazzar never had any chance, like really, according to prophecy. He, it was predicted to fall in the, that third generation down. It was only going to last a couple generations. Babylon, the head of gold, the most glorious of all empires, was really short-lived. Um, in chapter 51, it mentions that it would be specifically by the Medes in verses 11 and 28 of chapter 51 in Jeremiah. It mentions that the Medes would come. Now, Jeremiah, he existed before they even went into captivity. These prophecies happened before Jerusalem was even taken. And he's like, okay, so Babylon's going to fall on Nebuchadnezzar's grandson's generation. It will fall by trickery and a snare just like what happened with the, the river and the gate and all of that. Um, it would be the Medes that conquered it, not necessarily the Persians, but the Medes. And he mentions in the same chapter in verse 36 that it would be through um, the drying up of her sea and her springs that it would be conquered. Like, kind of wonder if Cyrus read the Bible or if that was just a brilliant thought. And it also mentions in verse 39 that it was going to be during a feast. Like, there you have it. Like, they could have read Jeremiah and gone, huh. So at any rate, that's one of those chapters that has a lot of interesting history. But the main application that I take from this chapter is that when God provides a living example for us, when he provides wisdom written out for us, it's incredibly sad. <laughs> if we choose to test it out 
by experience to essentially not receive the wisdom, but I don't know. I'm thinking of my own kids. Um, <laughs> Is the wall hard, mom? Yes, the wall is hard. I don't believe you. I'm going to go run straight at it and see if the wall is hard. We do this, though. Like, it's not just kids. It's not just teenagers. We do this. God's word tells us things. His spirit speaks to our hearts. We have our conscience and the Holy Spirit guiding us. And yet, oftentimes, we still choose to go, yeah, but I want to do it my way. Actually, God. And then we wind up learning the hard way. But the good thing is, whereas to err is human, we all make mistakes. We all sometimes choose to go about it the hard way and not learn from history, not learn from the word, not listen to the voice of the spirit. But all he's looking for is repentance once we finally come to our senses. When the chastisement happens, when we discover the wall is hard, when things prove to be exactly as God said they would be, and we're proved to be wrong. All it takes is for us to humble ourselves like Nebuchadnezzar. God restored his kingdom to him. And I, I really believe that God wants mercy in every single circumstance. He doesn't want to chastise us. His purpose of discipline is so that we will repent, so that we will turn to him. So that's what I, I find as the 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 best application of this chapter, and the saddest part. Belshazzar, he could have repented, and he didn't, and thus his kingdom ended. And, he, and I believe that that is oftentimes one of those lessons that we don't like to learn from. We always want to find the encouragement. We want to find the, um, the, the comforting applications. But sometimes God wants us to look at the disciplined ones too. And tonight... My best offer is learn from it, <laughs> repent. So with that, I'll just close in prayer. God, we thank you for your word. Even when it is correction, rebuke, Lord, even when it's sometimes what feels like just tedious instruction, all of those um, lists of names and laws at certain parts of the Bible, and we tend to love and be drawn towards those passages that that lift us up and encourage us and comfort us and and i know you understand you understand you put those parts in there because you knew we needed them but lord you also included the admonitions and the corrections lord and i pray that you would help each one of us to to respond to your spirit when the next time you want to correct us from your word lord i pray that you'd make my heart humble and, and ready to receive next time you want to speak to me something to correct me. And Lord, I thank you that you're a good father and that you do lead us and raise us up and help us to grow into maturity in you, Lord, that you, you teach us and you instruct us and you discipline us. And so, Lord, we thank you for being that good father who cares enough to actually um, discipline us at times. So, Lord, we thank you and we bless your name and glorify you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.